Well, actually, acting was never um, my ambition. Ballet was the thing from, I suppose, about the age of three. And I went to see The Red Shoes, which must have inspired so many youngsters. My sister was the one who wanted to act. She was at a drama school. Uh, but as far as I was concerned, acting was really of no interest. It was something that my older sister did. Uh, anyway, my father was a BBC variety radio producer. He produced um, various programs like the classic Victor Sylvester and the lovely Vera Lynn. And as a sideline, he was part of the revival of square dancing. And uh, they had a, a program, I think, on the radio called Happy Hoedown. But he had put together a demonstration dance team and with his band that I think was led by some lovely man called Phil Cardew. Um, they used to tour the UK doing demonstrations. And at one of them, he met Michael Balkan. And they got chatting, and I suppose he must have mentioned to Sir Michael, he wasn't Sir Michael then, of course, that uh, he had a daughter who was interested in acting. And so Mr. Balkan said, well, why don't you bring your daughter along to the studios? It might interest her. So a date was set, and unfortunately my mother was ill, and I had to go along too. So along we trundled. And uh, at some point, we were in the canteen, no doubt having a sticky bun or something. And Alexander McKendrick happened to be in there at the same time, probably in production of The Man in the White Suit. And uh, he saw me, this funny little face behind the sticky bun, and he decided that I might be of use for this one particular little scene with Sir Alec Guinness. So I think probably the casting department contacted my parents and said, could I just participate in this scene, and the which I did. And that was really the beginning. But as far as wanting to act was concerned, no, it, it was not on my list of things at all. Yes, The Man in the White Suit was, I mean, I wouldn't actually call it a big break. I just remember being fed uh, toffees, or well, very chewy caramels, to disguise the fact that I had a, a rather sort of pinner Middlesex accent and was meant to have a Lancashire accent, I think. So I was happy. I mean, it was rationing time, and the props man just kept feeding me soft, gooey caramels, and that was great. But, I mean, that, if one can call it a big break, that was it. It was, it was the, the start, if you like. It was the little seed that, that sowed whatever happened afterwards. So what did happen afterwards was um, within the year, I did another film, which I'm afraid I can't remember the title of, um, another momentous performance. Um, anyway, uh, within the year, uh, Mr. McKendrick had obviously remembered me and the casting director wrote to my mother to say, could I go along to Ealing for uh, a screen test? And this would have been sort of autumn 1950, I think it was. And so I did the screen test. And within the week, another letter arrived saying that um, I had got the part. And uh, so we started filming that very cold winter. After that first appearance in The Man in the White Suit and then returning for the screen test, it all suddenly became very serious. Although, I mean, I was only six and a half going on seven, so it wasn't um, dramatic or, or, except it was dramatic because in order for me to scream, he screamed. And I was so scared at seeing this grown man screaming that I screamed involuntarily, and that was perhaps why I got the part. But he was um, a very um, dynamic and intense sort of man. You know, you have to remember, I came from a very cosy, quiet, comfortable suburban sort of life where the most dramatic thing was not being able to go to my ballet lesson. And here was this man in this enclosed film set situation 
screaming at me and as I say, I screamed back. Obviously worked. Again, that's it, Max. No, again. My first encounter, really, with uh, deaf children was when we were doing location work up at the Royal Manchester School for the Deaf. Um, and then that was a really extraordinary experience. The, the sound or the lack of sound in the classrooms I remember being sort of weird, knowing that they were children of, of my age, and so we played together, um, but there was definitely this lack of immediate verbal contact. That, that was my, really my only experience, and that was, of course, during the making of the film. I first met Phyllis Calvert and Terence Morgan, obviously, I suppose during the making of the film, I don't know whether because they were playing my mother and father, there was a sort of pre-shooting um, familiarization process or something or other, but she played my mother uh, later on as well in a film called Child in the House, and we did become very close within the family, I have to say, with her and her husband and her daughter, and she was a most motherly and lovely person, except the first time that I saw her when we were on location. Um, it was in Hammersmith um, on a bomb site, because this is sort of post-war, so that was a really bare and rough and ugly sort of experience. But she had um, a studio car, which was this giant Humber Super Snipe, and they would come and do her makeup in there. But in those days, I suppose because it was a black and white film and, and they had these giant um, arc lights, she had purple lips. And I can remember being horrified to see this lovely familiar person with these rather scary purple lips. Anyway, it was all explained to me. Um, but the other horrifying thing was seeing Terence Morgan in the makeup room one morning. I must have arrived early to have my plaits done, which was the only thing that I ever had done in the hair and makeup. And shock horror, there was this very romantic, handsome man without any of his American tan pancake makeup on. And I would imagine probably with a bit of a five o'clock shadow or something. And I, I thought, who is this person? I just don't recognize this man who I was falling in love with desperately on set. Oh dear, poor man, it was probably the, he hadn't got his face together yet in the morning. Anyway, that, that was my, but I mean, everybody was simply wonderful to me, I have to say. I've been thinking a lot about this, and in fact, this whole experience has brought so much back to me and made me realize how I've put it to the back of my mind, uh, all due to my mother's attitude, really, because she so much wanted me to be leading a very ordinary little girl's life, and I was very lucky to have these marvelous film experiences, but we came very definitely back down to earth afterwards, and I think uh, as far as direction was concerned, um, I, I just felt, I felt it, and I still do just feel it, and uh, it, it was a case of what the scene was about, having a director who was able to communicate what was going on, the lines that I had to say, what the other actors were doing. It was all very intuitive, really, that's all I can say, it was just a feeling. All my memories are usually based on food or they're sort of sensory in terms of, I do remember this beautiful pale blue satin quilted dressing gown that I had and I was given it at the end of the film and that was absolutely wonderful. And I can remember being taken into the wardrobe department 
which as you can imagine for a little girl was like going into Aladdin's cave and seeing all these fabulous costumes and accessories and hats and shoes and I mean I just had my pleated grey skirt and fair isle twin set I expect but anyway it was all there to look at and um, but I, I don't remember you see I was just six and a half going on seven and I had this mother who kept saying to me you're you're not any you're very lucky you're not special you're not exceptional you're just an ordinary little girl is very lucky and in fact I was thinking as I was coming in here today I can remember being on the bus with my mother and um, we were sitting trundling along to somewhere or other and a woman came up and said excuse me but you know your daughter looks awfully like Mandy Miller and my mother replied yes she does doesn't she Lots of people keep saying that. And that was it. That was my mother's approach. You know, forget it. Just let's carry on, normal life. It wasn't a career as such. Nothing was planned. It all just happened as actually so much in my life has. Um, a career sort of suggests something organized with a focus and, and, and it wasn't like that at all. It all just, appeared as far as I was concerned. I went to school. I was very lucky with the schools that I went to. Um, the first school I went to was a very small school in Pinna and uh, they seemed to take it in their stride that I would disappear off maybe once a year to do a film and then later on I went to a ballet school where obviously there was a sort of connection to the entertainment business and they just accepted the fact that I would go and make a film and then come back again or go to a premiere or something or other but um, a career just maybe looking retrospectively one would say it was a career but it, it just was a period of my life where I fell into meeting a lot of wonderful people and uh, having a great time. After those years, I suppose it would be maybe eight, nine or ten years of doing various things from, from films. I did some television, um, I did a couple of plays, I did a touring play. I began to be very realistic and honest with myself and I thought you can't carry on just doing this intuitively and from your feelings you do need to have a bit more training so it was a sort of crunch point of thinking right I've either got to go to drama school and learn my craft or find something else to do uh, the which I did I found marriage and babies and gardening and cooking and all of those sorts of things although since then I've sort of touched on it doing some teaching and um, some radio work in South Africa but uh, no I'm basically a very domestic creature. The last time I saw the film was maybe four or five years ago and it it was strange it brought back um, associative sort of memories. I still can't believe really that it was me. Uh, I'm better off really remembering things like the film that I made with Kenneth Moore, Raising a Riot, I suppose just because I was that much older and was more accustomed to the whole business of being in front of a camera and all of that. But um, I realized the impact now that the film had on so many other people through them and through them coming up to me and saying oh I remember seeing that film and it meant so much to me or I think the thing about the film was the timing of it in as much as um, uh, as I understand it the Royal Manchester School for the Deaf which was associated with the university was running the only course in the world for deaf teachers. Now, I may be 
quite wrong about this, but I, I think it was just the timing that there was a sort of opening up and rather than a feeling of, oh, you know, my child is deaf and, and they'll have to just learn to sign or they're over in the corner of the room and they can't communicate. I think it was just a moment when that whole education of deaf children came to the fore and the film was made and, and so it was all great timing and certainly very good luck for me. It was nominated for um, a BAFTA. With, um, now I don't think it was the film, I think actually it was me as um, the best mm, supporting newcomer or whatever the terminology is, together with um, Dorothy Tutin for The Importance of Being Earnest, um, the lovely Dorothy Allison who played Miss Stockton, the teacher in the famous ba 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 scene. Look at the front. Look at the back. And she became a very close family friend afterwards. And Claire Bloom for Limelight. And Claire Bloom, not surprisingly, got it. I mean, such a wonderful film, so beautiful she was. I, I was lucky enough to go to various premieres and um, I remember going to a couple of Royal Command film performances and was presented to the Queen and mm -hmm. I remember her turning to the Duke of Edinburgh and saying, oh, this is Mandy, you remember? And I uh, presented flowers to Princess Margaret at another occasion, um, but obviously I was older then, more mature, able to handle the publicity. <laughs>